Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Back in the book of Joel, picking it up, chapter 1, verse 14. Remember, Joel simply means Yahweh is God, and it's true, he is the only God. We started in chapter 1 talking about the locust army. And remember that they're not actually locusts, so they have the, the teeth of a lion. And remember, there's four stages of that locust army. And, and how an actual locust is, is, is much of their life that is underground, behind the scenes. But then there at the very end, that they do come out, they manifest themselves. And who, who is the locust army that God's word speaks of? We went to Revelation chapter 9 to document where it's a perfect overlay of this book of Joel, where it tells you about the locust army. And once again, it says that they have the, teeth, the cheek teeth of a lion. But it says that they have the hair of women, meaning that they are so gentle. But the words that come out of their mouth is all lies, deception. So who is it? We found out that it's the fallen angels, along with the Kenites, evil spirits. The locust army is simply Satan's army that he uses to deceive the people. And in Revelation chapter 9, it spoke about how they have power as the power of a scorpion. Well, how does a scorpion have power? The very word scorpion in the Greek comes from skopos, which means to scope out. And what they do, they, they hide in the rocks. They hide away and they wait for their prey. They watch for the prey to get just close enough to them. Then they latch on to them and sting them, paralyzing the enemy. And then they even put their digestive juices into its body and just completely melts the inside of its prey. And that's what the locust army does to God's children who have not read God's word, but spiritually. Mean by the lies that come out of their mouth. They completely paralyze God's children because they don't have the seal of God in their brain. And that's what it said. God gave the locust army specific instructions he said that he said you can't hurt any green thing or any tree, showing them, you're showing us they're not actual locusts. But he said the only people you can hurt are those that have not the seal of God in their forehead, meaning they don't understand God's word. They haven't studied to show themselves approved. So that they, they lurk away. And remember, it's simply Satan's army and the fallen angels, like we talked about in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, they will be cast out onto this earth. When Satan is cast out and he plays the role of Antichrist as the false Messiah claiming to be Jesus Christ. And the fallen angels will, dis will disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. And it, it, said, it said that they have a breastplate, only it's not a priest's breastplate, but it's a, it's a breastplate of iron. But they claim to be priests. And you see, there are many false teachers in this world today. Remember, you cannot forget about how the evil spirits work. How it says in the book of Timothy, the evil spirits will wax worse and worse and worse. And evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. So you got to pay attention. God said in Jeremiah, he said, that cursed be the man that puts their trust in man and make it flesh his arm. So any man that claims to be a preacher of God's word, you better make sure what they say lines up exactly with what God's word says. So this book of Joel is teaching us. How to, to beware of the great deception that's coming, the coming of the false Christ and the, the fallen angels, the Kenites, and just the, the false ministers that he will use to deceive the people. That's what this book of Joel is about. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 1, verse 14. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and we thank you for this book of Joel and these minor prophets that tell us exactly what's going to happen even in our future. And we thank you for giving us this building so we have a place to come and fellowship in your name and a place we can teach your word exactly as it's written. And we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and understanding of this word and help us to teach it. And we just ask you just for your will to be done and your words be spoken during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, so we're picking up Joel chapter 1, verse 14. And remember in, chap in um, chapter 1, verse 13, it said about how, how the meat and the drink offering will be cut off. And we went to where that's documented in another place in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where it says the abomination of desolation, how he will make a covenant with the people for one week. That would, be, that would have been a seven-year period. But as we learn in Mark 13 in that Revelation chapter 9 that we read, that's been shortened to a five-month period. But it says in the middle of the week, the, the desolate tour comes on the wings of desolation, 
and he cuts off the meat offering, the drink offering. What is that to us today? It's communion. And what did Jesus Christ say to do when he said, take the bread symbolic of my body, take, take the wine symbolic of my blood? He said, you do this in remembrance of me while well, I am gone. But you see, when Satan arrives on earth, he claims to be Jesus Christ. So he'll be saying, you have no need to take communion anymore because I, I, I have returned. You don't need to take it in remembrance of me anymore. So in that middle of the five month period, that communion is cut off, but not from God's elect. Never from God's elect. You will not be deceived by him. So that's where we pick it up. Joel chapter 1 verse 14. And it reads, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. What God's saying is, return to me and repent. Notice, not, not a feast, but a fast. He's saying that you, you get that mourning out of the way because God's wrath comes upon those that don't follow him. So he's saying you come and you make an assembly. You gather the people. You repent of your idolatry, of your sins, and you return to the Lord Jesus Christ and have how God told us to worship him and not how man teaches. Verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And we talked about how when we started the book of Joel, how, how there's, there's no date given about when this prophecy was given to Joel. And that there's only one date given in this whole book. And we just read it, the day of the Lord. Well, what, what is the day of the Lord? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, it says, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Simply meaning the Lord's day is the thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. That day that when Jesus Christ returns and all are turned into spiritual bodies. But those who were deceived, those who didn't make the cut, they still have a mortal soul. But they will be taught in that millennium age. That's called the Lord's day. So what this book of Joel is about, teaching us the things that happen right up to the Lord's day. Teaching us the things that will happen just prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 16, and it, it comes as a destruction to those who are deceived, but not to God's elect. Verse 16, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. And remember, we talked about it in Hebrews chapter 5, verse, verse 12 in the following verses. How it says, you've been in the church so long, you should be teaching by now, but you're stuck on milk. It says that, that you have not matured in God's word, and you haven't, you haven't got to the meat of it. And, and God says there in that Hebrews chapter 5, he says, Strong meat belongeth to those who are of full age, meaning that you are a mature Christian. You're not stuck on salvation. We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected, and that's the greatest thing that's ever happened. But God says that you can't teach salvation over and over. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, if you just continually go back to, to salvation... It says that it's like you just keep crucifying Jesus Christ over and over and over. That's Hebrews chapter 6. So it says you get into the meat of God's word. And it says that in that Hebrews chapter 5, that that meat gives you the ability to discern between good and evil. But you see, what it says the meat is cut off, meaning that God's word is not taught in many churches. That the meat is never taught. They teach salvation. But after you, after you come to salvation, it's time to get into the deeper truth, to the understanding of God's word in its entirety. But the meat is cut off, just meaning the false prophets who claim to be teachers of God's word, they never teach God's word exactly as it's written. And that's exactly what Amos chapter 8 verse 11 says. It says there's a, there's a day coming of famine, but the famine is not for bread or for thirst of water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. That prophecy has come to pass today. Because so few churches teach God's word exactly as it's written. The meat has been cut off. But not from the true churches that teach God's word. Verse 17. And notice the joy and the gladness from the house of God is cut off. There is no joy. There's no gladness without truth. Verse 17. The seed is rotten under their clods. The gardens are laid desolate. The barns are broken down. For the corn is withered. And that word withered, it means to me ashamed or disappointed, confounded. And you see, the, the seeds were maybe planted, but they, they never got the rain. They never kept continuing to get truth. So the seed it just blasts in the field. It, it never grows up to produce fruit. And like it says in the book of Timothy, 
It says many times people, they learn and learn and learn, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth. I mean, they go to church their whole life, Sunday after Sunday, but they just listen to some guy teaching. Not teaching God's word, but him just speaking. So many churches, they also just get bogged down in traditions of men and rituals, ceremonial observance that have nothing to do with God's word. You remember what we read in Colossians chapter 2 at the end of the chapter. How it says that, that all those things, that self-imposed religion, it's absolutely worthless. So they learn and learn and learn. Learn all types of things, but never God's word. And they never come to the knowledge of the truth. And that seed, the truth does not grow. And they cannot produce fruit. I mean, they can't understand God's word, let alone share it with others. Why? Because they were never taught. Verse 18. How do the beasts groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed. That means to be confused, but also means to be entangled. Entangled in religion, traditions of men. Because they have no pasture. You know what a pasture is? It's, it's supposed to be taken care of by the pastor. By the pastor, the one that's supposed to be teaching God's word. But these animals, just being symbolic of God's children. It's saying they are groaning there because they are so hungry for truth, but they don't get it in most churches. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate, even because they're going to be deceived by the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That word desolate, it means to be confounded, astonished, devastated. That's how so many will be because they are going to be deceived by the false one. Verse 19. O oh, oh Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. That means because of that drought, that is, it's just so heat, it turns into a fire and it devours everything. And we do have to take this also with, with the twofold meaning, how even how, how the Kenites, they rip everybody off every chance they get with high interest, People that let themselves get so steeped into debt so deep they can't even come out. That's how the Kenites work. But see, that, that has to do with flesh. But God's Word teaches us how to overcome those things. But what's so much more important is the spiritual devastation that comes on. And that, that word desolate, it, what it really means is to, to become guilty in the last verse. And they will be guilty. But it's saying everything that you have is just stripped away. Like we read earlier in chapter 1. I mean, your blessings, you're not having any because of that drought, because you don't have any of the living water, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 20. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And that rivers of waters dried up, that takes us once again, just how Hosea took us there, to Revelation chapter 16, to the sixth vial. How it says that sixth vial will be poured out, and the great river Euphrates will be dried up. And then what does it say? It says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Simply the three roles of Satan, the unholy trinity, if you want to put it that way. But what, what does it say those spirits do? It say they are the spirits of devils working miracles going to the kings of the earth. Getting them to set up that one world system. To usher in for Satan to return on earth claiming to be Jesus Christ. And how, how does he deceive people? Daniel chapter 8 verse 23 through 25. It says that he comes in with prosperity and by peace he shall destroy many. Not by war and destruction. No, Satan comes in to be, he arrives claiming to be Savior. Claiming to be Messiah. Bringing about world peace for, for the first time ever. To where there will be no more war. It will be a one world governmental system. And Satan comes and he perfects that system. And only then will it be perfect. There will, the, the kings of the earth will almost get it set up at first. But then the deadly wound comes. That's when Satan arrives on earth and he claims to be God. And he heals the one world system. And says all the world wanders after the beast. I speak of Revelation chapter 13. Is where all that's written that I just said. So he comes in with peace. And like he says in Daniel chapter 11, it says, he will, he'll, he'll give the spoil and the riches to anyone that will worship him. And what's he going to be saying? He's going to be saying, these are all your rewards that, that you have coming to you because you've worshipped me your whole life. Here's all your rewards. You've been such a great servant to me. Now just continue to serve me. It's now heaven on earth. 
And almost the entire world falls into that deception. Why? Because of the locust army, the evil spirits, the fallen angels who arrive with Satan. They get caught up in that deception. Don't you allow yourself to be deceived. Go right into chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand, and it is, it is so nigh at hand even today. Nobody knows the year, nobody knows the day, but we watch. And it's saying, it's saying sound the alarm, and don't remember Ezekiel chapter 33. It says, if you know the enemy's coming, you know the sword's coming, and you refuse to, and you refuse to warn the people, their blood is going to be on your hands. Meaning, the, and what is the blood that will be shed? Spiritual blood, spiritual death. Because many Christians that have been Christians their whole life but will never taught God's word worship Satan because they think that he is Jesus Christ. This is telling you to sound the alarm. Those of you that have eyes to see and ears to hear and know the truth. Verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. And th this word darkness, it means misery, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. All of those things are going to be happening when the false Messiah arrives. And, and, and what also what, it, what this has to do with it, <clears throat> excuse me, leading up to that time is ignorance. Because the meat is not brought into the church. The church is not taught. So yeah, there is ignorance. There's sorrow that abounds. And that word gloominess, it means misfortune. I mean, your blessings are taken away if you follow false doctrine. If you are deceived. Um, continuing the, the end of that verse. So, a gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong. Check out that word strong. If you take it back to the prime, it means to close the eyes. That's what they do, what the false ministers do. What Satan does, they close the eyes of the people. Because what do so many churches teach? You don't have to worry about the book of Revelation. You're not even going to be here in the tribulation of Antichrist. You just have to have a relationship with God. And yeah, a relationship with God is absolutely paramount. But I mean, do you think you're going to get blessed by Him if you just lay your Bible and just sit on the shelf? You never even read it? You never read the letter that He wrote to us so we can have understanding? That ignorance and sorrow abounds because of the deception that closes the eyes of so many. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations saying that this is the most vicious army of all time. But remember, the army is spiritual. And make a note of Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, where it says the tribulation of Antichrist. is basically the exact same thing it says here. How it's the greatest tribulation that ever has been or ever will be. Because the entire world, except for God's elect, pours after him. That's billions of people. This locust army, such a vicious army, but they are vicious with deception. Remember that, the hair of women, they're so gentle, but it's just lies and lies and lies that pours out of their mouth. Check out what anybody says. Make sure it matches up with the word of God, or they're a false prophet if they claim to be a teacher of God's word. Verse 3, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them. And behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing shall escape them. What's this saying? This is telling you how destructive they are to the souls of men. I mean, before they get there, like the Garden of Eden just means beauty, perfection. But when they get done with it, it's a desolate wilderness. That's what the deceivers do to the soul of God's children. It just completely wipes them out, wipes away all their blessings they would have received. Any truth they may have had, they just take it all away for religion. Verse 4. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. Once again, not actual locusts. And as horsemen, so shall they run. As war horses. Because this is that, it's a, it's a spiritual army. Remember, fallen angels are supernatural. We're gonna, that's going to be documented here in a second. But when you read this, you can't help but think of Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. Where it says that, that if you're wearied by the, by the footmen, then how are you going to be able to contend with the horses? What that's saying, if, 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 if even right now, just, just if people in the flesh, if that's too much for you, 
And if you can't even take the pressure that, that happens in your life right now, it's saying you have no chance against the locust army, against the fallen angels who are supernatural, who can perform miracles. Satan performs miracles in the sight of men, as it says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. May fire come down from heaven whenever he wants, performing those miracles. So if you can't even take the pressure, maybe being mocked a little bit for being a Christian, you can't even take that now, then you have no chance when the true army comes, when the fallen angels arrive, when the false Christ arrives himself. You're saying you have no chance if you can't take what's going on. So, so man up or woman up or be a man or woman or a child of God. Don't forget what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says there's nothing that comes on anybody that isn't common to all man. And it says God will never allow something to happen to you that you can't handle. And anything that happens to you, God always will give you a way out. That's 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. So don't be one of those that, that just gets wearied by the footmen. Just by, just by everyday activities, maybe being mocked a little bit, being oppressed a little bit. Because you can't handle it now. When the Calvary comes, the fallen angels and the false Christ, you don't stand a chance. So you be ready. Verse 5. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoured the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array. Once again that word strong to close the eyes. And you can't help but think, you have these horses and chariots and a flame of fire. What does that remind you of? Ezekiel chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 2. Those vehicles. Ezekiel chapter 1. Those circular vehicles that's made of polished spectrum metal. Polished bronze. That circular vehicle that God brought the throne, his very throne to earth. That vehicle that Elijah was taken into heaven before he ever died, he was taken. Very likely that's how the fallen angel will arrive <laughs> in those vehicles. So don't let that, don't let that um, scare you or deceive you or anything like that. It's, it's all written. That, that's all written. It's, it's, not, it's not a new thing. God told us all about it. And you can't help but think about it. When it says devoureth the stubble, about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where it says every man's work is going to be made manifest. And, and it says that their works, whether it's good or bad, that it's going to be tried by a fire, I mean, it's going to be tested. And see, it's, it's got a few different things, stubble, hay, iron, silver, or gold. That's the levels of works that you do. You see, if your works are just stubble, meaning you never really do anything for God, never study His Word, never try to plant a seed, if your works are just stubble, they're completely devoured by the flame. All you, any little good works you have, they're washed away when you because you're going to be you're going to be deceived by the false one. But you see, if your works are silver, if your works are if your works are gold. They go through that fiery furnace and the slag runs off, meaning any weaknesses you have go away and you become even a stronger servant for God. So your works will be tested whether they're good or bad. Everyone gets exactly what they deserve. Don't let your works be stubble and just go away in a puff of smoke. Verse 6. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. This, this word blackness, it, it's not a good translation. What it means to, to, is to like illuminate is the actual definition, but it means paleness. And, and it can also mean a flush of anxiety is the definition. So yeah, that they tremble. Those that haven't read God's word, because when they see those vehicles, they see supernatural entities performing miracles. That would be a real, that would give a lot of anxiety to someone who hasn't studied God's word. But to you, it's not a problem to you because you already read exactly how it happens. Verse 7. They shall run like mighty men, as Gibor in the Hebrew. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his, on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. This means they are extremely perfectly organized and they will not stray away from their purpose. Remember the fallen angels, Genesis chapter 6, the book of Jude, verse 6. They left their original habitation. They were never born of woman, but they came to seduce women instead. So they're locked in chains for eternity, meaning that their soul, they have no chance at salvation. And let's go ahead and read the next verse, verse 8. Neither shall one thrust another, like it says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 13, the ten supernatural kings, that's ten of the seven thousand fallen angels. You got ten kings at the head of them, right under Satan. It says that they all have one mind. They all just follow Satan. They follow Satan so loyally. 
And that they all have one mind, meaning that they're not going to try to oppress each other. They're not going to get in each other's way. I mean, that organized spiritual army of death, that army of Satan, they shall walk everyone in this path. Once again, you can't stray them off their path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Why? Because they're supernatural beings. They were never born in the flesh. They're in a spiritual body. So yeah, if they were, if the, you could try to put a sword right through them. Not going to do anything to them. They're not flesh. But also to take this spiritual, this word, this word, um, this word wounded, it means stopped. And what, what's the sword of the Lord spiritually? Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. It's, it's God's tongue. It's the word of God. So I mean, if you tried to save them or something like that, that would be the most ignorant thing that you could do. You cannot stop them. They, they worship Satan loyally, and they are already hell bound. They are damned, no chance at salvation. So if you were ever to get some stupid idea in your head, try to, to convert a fallen angel, first of all, if you had that mindset, you wouldn't even realize they were a fallen angel, and you just, you'd be deceived by them. But it's saying they're, they are completely set in their ways, they're damned. There's nothing you can do that no one can ever do to change their mind. They're hell bound. Verse 9. They shall run to and fro in the city. What, the, what this means is that they are like beasts of prey. Remember the scorpion lying in wait, waiting for the prey just to say the right religious thing, just to deceive them. Just as, as soon as they can, just lying in wait. Run to and fro in the city. They shall run up on the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. They shall run up up on the wall. What is our wall of protection? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, Almighty God. But you see, they're going to try to climb up that wall. They're trying to go, go over it. But you see, they cannot. Because God's protection is perfect on His election, on those that serve Him. But they're going to do everything they can to try to deceive God's elect. And that's who they're going to focus on is you. Why? They already have everybody else. Look at so many churches today. The food's been cut off. They're not taught. They're, it's, it's not going to take five seconds for Satan to deceive them. So their sole goal, I mean Satan's main goal, deceive God's elect. And make no, make no mistake, he knows exactly who you are, but you stood against him in the first earth age. That's why you were chosen before the foundation of the world. So you would stand up against him once again because God knows he can trust you. So yeah, they pretty much put all their plans into just trying to figure out a way to deceive God's elect. Remember Mark 13, Christ said, If I had not shortened the time, if it were possible, even God's elect would be deceived. Don't ever think that you know so much that, that you don't need to study anymore or anything like that. The great, remember the, the greatest affliction of all time, tribulation of the Antichrist and the locust army. Don't be deceived by him. Verse 10, and, and notice, notice how it's that they'll enter in the windows like a thief, come right into your house. Well, how does that happen? Do you remember in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, how it says that there will be an image, and the image comes alive, the image can speak. How's that going to happen? I mean, turn on your television, every single channel, it's going to say Jesus Christ has returned. Look at Messiah. He, he's here in Jerusalem. Let's come worship him. Coming right into your very house with that deception. They will use every single way that they can to try to deceive you. Verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now th this, is, this is what's written of how the return of Jesus Christ will be. But it's also how the return of the false Christ will be. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12. Uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 2. Satan copies Jesus Christ at every turn. Remember in that Revelation chapter 6. Yeah, um, the sun darkened, moon turned to blood. Only one thing, only... Yeah, that sounds exactly like the return of Christ, doesn't it? Only one thing. It says that the stars fall like untimely figs. Meaning they're out of season. Meaning that Satan and his fallen angels arriving at the sixth trumpet. That's before Christ returns. Christ does not return until the seventh. But you make no mistake that, that is the false Messiah that arrives first, claiming to be God, and, and no one's getting taken anywhere else. Jesus Christ is returning here, not taking anybody out of here. So you know that if you're still in a flesh body, someone's on earth claiming to be God, performing miracles, that's the false Christ. Don't be deceived by him. Verse 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, 
who is his army, that's God's elect, but also the heavenly host, the remnant that are with God today. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executed his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? You know that God's elect can abide it. The believers, those that, those that study God's word in depth, that don't get stuck on milk but get to the meat, you can abide it. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fiery furnace that was heated seven times hotter than it needed to be. Nebuchadnezzar threw him in the fire. He said, wait, how many people did we throw in the fire? I thought we only threw in three. But I see four men walking in the fire. And one is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar knew the Son of God was in the fire with him. That was before Jesus Christ had ever even been born in the flesh. But you see the Son of God walking. You know who it is. And Nebuchadnezzar knew. That, and that was that perfect type in Daniel chapter 3. How, yeah, maybe the whole other world is going to worship the false one. Yeah, Satan's going to, he's going to threaten to cast you into hell because he comes to be God. You don't worship me, you're hell bound. He's going to threaten to throw you in that fiery furnace spiritually. But that has no effect on you. Just like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they, were, they came out of the fire. You could not even smell smoke on their clothes. That's how much God protects you. Destruction could be going on all around you. And by destruction, I mean spiritual deception. But for, your, but for God's elect, those that know Him and His Word, it has no effect on you ever. Remember, God is our wall. Verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Once again, the saying, you repent of your sins, come out of idolatry and religion and traditions. And he said, you return to me with your whole heart. Remember how we read it in the book of Hosea? Many have a heart divided. I mean, they, they, they truly love God. They want to serve Him. But they can't come out of the traditions of men that they've been taught. That's all they ever know. Their heart stays divided. And you see how it was with Israel back in the time of Hosea. They wanted to serve Yahweh, but they still wanted to serve their other gods. Their false gods who don't even exist. So do not have a heart divided. But any single thing that has to do with religion, if God didn't tell us to do it in His Word, you come out of it. Period. Why would you listen to what some man tells you to do when it has to do with religion if God never said to do it? Verse 13. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. What's this mean? It says that you return to Him on the inside with your mind. Not making a show of it. Oh, I, I, I've, been, I've been such a bad person to God. I want everyone to know how repentant I am. Yeah, you're, you're just doing that for a show. Saying, don't, don't return to me by rending, by rending your outer garments, by making a big show of it. You don't need to tell people what you're doing. You just you make the choice right now. Return to Jesus Christ in the way he taught us to worship him. And any, uh, anything else is worthless. Verse, uh, continuing verse 13. For he, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. And this, this is quoted in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where it says God, God is long-suffering. That means he's very patient, and he's slow to wrath. And it says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. That's all he wants, you to repent and to love and serve him. That, that's all he wants. It's that simple. Just follow what he told us to do in his word. He is so merciful and he is so patient because he's a loving God. Verse 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Those that love in God and serve him, they know that he will. They know that how he wrote over and over and over. You repent of their sins, they are washed away as if they never existed. So those who serve him know even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. You start to once again receive those blessings to where you can offer sacrifices to Him, but that's spiritual. Don't ever think that animal sacrifice is something you want to do. That would be blasphemous abomination if you were to sacrifice an animal. Because like it says in Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus Christ shed His blood for one and all times. It would be sacrilegious for you to actually do a blood sacrifice. But remember Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. God said, I do, not, I do not desire your burnt offerings or your sacrifice. I desire your mercy, which means your love, and for you to have the knowledge of God. Don't overlook that second part. 
God said, I want you to love me, and I desire for you to have the knowledge of God. Also remember Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't become a part of that group. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Once again, and that was what it's about to be telling us to do. This is what you do when you do repent. When you turn back to the right way. Once again, you, you repent and you gather everyone together. Verse 16. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. The saying, don't leave anybody out. You gather everybody. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. And by this mentioning all these people, this is letting you know there's not a single person that's exempt from God's wrath if they go away from following him. I mean, don't ever think, oh, no, I can do whatever I want. God loves me. I'm special. No, you never read. God said, I am not a respecter of persons. So no one is exempt from God's wrath if they choose to follow traditions and other way of religion. He said, you gather everybody up and you all repent and you just you return back to me. That's what this is about. Remember, this is the condition of the church leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. He's saying before it's too late, before the false Messiah comes, you repent and you turn to me. Remember, that, that wedding is coming. And we, are, we are meant to be the bride of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being that bridegroom. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3? He said, I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is spiritual, not physical. He's saying, I do not want you to worship some other God. I don't want you to call somebody else your, your God or your husband spiritually. So many people, they, they fall in, they take the Antichrist as their husband. And then just like the five foolish virgins, when Jesus Christ returns, they come in knocking on the door, saying, Christ, let us in. He says, I never knew you. you if you get deceived and you worship the false Christ, you absolutely do not get to take part in the wedding feast of the return of Jesus Christ. And who, who is his wife? It's God's elect. And they will never be deceived. Verse uh, 17. Or I didn't finish. Or, yeah, let, yeah, I finished. Verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, that's the true priests, the true teachers of God's word that teaches exactly as it's written. Let them weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. That the, heathen, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? And you cannot help but think of Moses, that great intercessor. Back in Exodus chapter 32, when, when Moses was only up on the mount 40 days, then they, they, they took a bunch of gold to Aaron and said, here, you make some golden calves. God said, Moses, I'm going to just kill them all. I'll make the nation right of you. But Moses, that great intercessor, he prayed for Israel. He prayed for his people, for God to have mercy, and we pray for our people as well. We do intercessory prayer as such a powerful thing. But don't, don't overlook well, and the heritage. What is the heritage of God's elect? Ezekiel 44, verse about 25 through 28. God says, do not give to Zadok as the upright one, God's elect. Don't give them any allotment of land. God says, I am their, I am their inheritance. I am their possession. And this last part, how it says, why should they say among the people, where is their God? I hope that you're ready for when the entire world is deceived by the false one and you refuse to worship him, everyone's going to be saying to you, where's your God? My God's right here. They're going to be saying, my God's right here. This one performing miracles. This one that brought world peace. They're going to be saying, where's your God? Your God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will be returned at that time. It will only be a very short time until he returns. You know who your God is. Verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Pity, remember, Ruhama from the book of Hosea. He will have mercy on them. And remember, he, he is a jealous God. You go worshiping any other way, any other God, yeah, his wrath is going to come down on you. And th this verse, it, it's, this is, ba this is um, basically what's written it's, it's the last verse of the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. That Song of Moses where it says in Revelation chapter 15, this is what the overcomers will be singing when Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, returns. 
with the main point, the climax of that song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 32. It says, their rock is not as our rock. Verse 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil. Remember, oil always symbolic of truth. And you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. God saying, if you repent and you return back to me, I'm going to pour out on you so many blessings, more than you even could have imagined. That's how God works. Verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the southern army, or the, the northern army, I'm sorry, but I will remove far from you the northern army, that's important, and will drive them into the land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his sting shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. That's quoted in Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 11. Do you know what Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 is about? It's about the very, very end, right before Jesus Christ returns. And it says the chief prince Meshach, which is Rosh in the Hebrew, which is Russia, comes with Persia, which is Iran, and Libya, and Ethiopia. And they come against the wall, or they come against the land of unwalled villages. And they come against the house of Israel. We learn from the book of Hosea, many of the house of Israel dwell in this United States of America. That northern army, once again, Russia, Iran, Kinder, Ethiopia, Libya, they will come against this land. But you know what, it said, what Ezekiel 38 and 39 is all about? God's saying, I want them to know who I, who I am, that I am God. And he says that he, he brings down hailstones on them. You read in Revelation chapter 16, the hailstones are 180 pounds. God rains down those hailstones on that northern army that comes against the United States. Very likely that those hailstones will come down and destroy them in Alaska, right when they're on their way to us. Remember, that is the very, very, very end. That, that happens basically simultaneously as Jesus Christ returns. So God's saying to us, don't worry, I'm going to take care of the north, northern army. You don't even have to worry about it. We're not going to fire a shot against them. We don't have to because God wants them, to, wants them to know that He is God and there is no other. Verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. 22. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. I mean... Plenty of truth, plenty of blessings for everyone. Remember, this is what happens if you return to God. You return to the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ and you serve Him and you dedicate your life to Him with a full, with a whole, with your whole heart. Not a heart divided. I mean, I have so many blessings, you don't even know what to do with them. Verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For He hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, and the first month. You'll see that word month is italics. It, it mean, this means I will give it to you as it was in the beginning. As it was before you fell, before you fell away to religion and ways of the world. So I will give you that former rain and the latter rain. The former rain is, is the beginning the, the, that it, it, um, it, it makes the seed to germinate. It makes it, so let, let's just t speak about it in the spiritual sense which is what this is teaching us. The former rain, you, you get the foundation, you could think of it as the milk even. I mean, you get, the, you get the basics of God's Word, that's the former rain. But then as you continue to study God's Word and get deeper and deeper, God gives you the latter rain. That's understanding of prophecy, that's, un, that's better understanding of just God's Word as a whole, and He will let you know exactly how it goes down in the end times. How? Because it's all written. All you have to do is read it. That latter rain that you see, a, a plant, it cannot grow in actuality. A plant cannot grow with the lat, without the latter rain. And you see, a child of God cannot grow spiritually or produce fruit without the latter rain, which is the deeper truths of God's Word that you can only understand if you study it exactly as it's written. Verse 24. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats that the wine vat shall overflow with wine and oil. The, the wine mass, that, that's where, where the juice runs down. Once again, you're going to be so blessed, you don't even, you can't even imagine it. 
when you serve God and how He told us to serve Him. And when you read this, you can't help but think of Psalm chapter 23. That's the, that's the many people would like to say that's the death psalm, but, but it's not. It's the resurrection psalm. Psalms 22 is the psalm of the crucifixion. But Psalms 23, how it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And what does he say? He says, I will restore the soul of those who follow me. And he, said, he says um, that, um, David speaking, he says, um, My cup runneth over, thou anointest my head with oil. Meaning, once again, just blessing after blessing after blessing. And you know what it says? It says, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. All those that mocked you for being a Christian. All those that made fun of you because you actually knew what was going on in God's Word. And you actually cared. God prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And your cup overflows with blessings and wisdom and love from Almighty God. Verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. My great army which I sent among you. This is the four stages of the locust. Don't overlook that last part. God said, this is my army. God's letting you know, yeah, even though it's Satan as the fallen angels and the Kenites, God's saying, I am always in control. He's letting us know you have nothing to worry about. We mentioned Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, how this is the greatest tribulation of all time is how it will be in the end. God's saying, i got complete control over them. He's saying, I, if, if I want them to do something, I'll make them do it. So don't worry about it. God always protects those who love and serve Him. God is always in control. That's why just like we read a fear, verse 21, Fear not, never anything to fear, ever. Verse 26, And you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people and me shall never be ashamed. That famine of the end times, that's for hearing the word of God, has no effect over those who study his word. Verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am, sacred name. And that I am the Lord, that's Yahweh, your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. If they return, they call that psalm assembly meaning they simply repent of their sins and worship God exactly how he told us. If you're aware of that locust army of the deception of the false Messiah, you will never be ashamed. Now what we're about to read, these last four verses, this is quoted almost word for word in Acts chapter 2. And what that was was Pentecost Day. Let's, let's read it, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Afterward what? After you return and you repent and you start receiving the latter rain, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Well, when does that happen? It's written in Mark 13. When the false Christ is here and you refuse to worship him, it says your own family and friends are going to deliver you up right to him because they think he's Christ. They're trying to save your soul. But it says in Mark 13, verse 9 through 13, how you will, you will be delivered up to the councils and for kings and rulers for Christ's sake. It says, do not premeditate what you will say, but you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. It's the, when that Holy Spirit speaks, it's that same tongue, that cloven tongue that was given to them on Pentecost Day. There were people from all over the world there, and every single one of them understood the Holy Spirit speaking in the very dialect of the language that they were, of the place where they were born. When, when the Holy Spirit speaks, it is a tongue that is understood by all people of the entire world. Not an unknown tongue. And that's why it says in Luke 21, it says that no one shall, that no one shall be able to gainsay nor resist when the Holy Spirit speaks through you. Because it goes out into every single language. Every person in the entire world will understand what you say. That is your destiny as God's elect. Verse, 20, uh, verse 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And notice how it says to come out on all flesh. Once again, by that same image that Satan used to deceive the world, it, the same image, it will be your trial when you are delivered up before the false one, going to be televised to the entire world. So, so the gospel can be published among all nations, as it says in Mark 13. 
And the entire world will have that opportunity to hear the truth. And many people at that very end will come out of that deception. No one can gainsay nor resist when the Holy Spirit speaks in every language all at one time. No man can ever do that. That's why it's, no one can deny it that hears that cloven tongue spoken. And notice, it said, sons and daughters shall prophesy. I hope you're not one of those that tries to put women under you. Verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That's divine judgment. Now remember how this is all quoted in Acts chapter 2, that day of Pentecost. And in, and in 1980, right at Pentecost, that there was, that there was a Mount St. Helens erupted. And it's known as the greatest destruction of a volcano of all time. And there was pillars of smoke. And there, was a, and there was a guy that was flying around in an airplane. And he took a picture of that smoke. And you see a face in the smoke. Blood. Or wonders in the heavens. Blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. And it's interesting to know this upcoming Pentecost, that will have been 40 years 40 being that day of that time of probation, how the children of Israel were in the wilderness 40 years leading up to the promised land. And what does that mean? Well, maybe it means nothing. But God says to watch. And he said that there would be wonders in the heavens, earth, in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And we've seen them come to pass. Even, even this just a few weeks ago on December 26th, the great annual solar eclipse, how they call it the ring of fire. But you see, there was a picture taken where, where the moon was like on its side and it looked like it was, it was coming up out of the water. And you see two red horns coming up out of the water. And have you ever read Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 where it says when the, how the false messiah, that religious beast, arrives. It says that he has two horns like a lamb, but he speaks as a dragon. Now, okay, so you're saying the false Christ has two horns? No, it's spiritual. Horns are symbolic of power. That means he has complete control over the political and the religion. He has control over the whole world except for God's elect. The false Messiah will look exactly like what anyone thinks Jesus Christ will look like. He will look exactly like what anybody thinks their God will look like. He comes claiming to be a Messiah. So, like I said, what, is that, what do those things mean? Well, maybe they mean nothing. But God said in Genesis chapter 1, he said, I, I, gave you the sign, I gave you the stars and the moon and the host of the heaven for signs and for seasons. So we watch. Verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Now we speak of the return of Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Satan copies it exactly. Now we speak of the true return, the seventh trump. Verse 32 to complete. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. That remnant, once again, is God's elect. Those who have the seal of God in their forehead, in their brain, like we read in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. That the deception of the fallen angels, of the false Christ, of the Kenites, of the false prophets, of the evil spirits, all those, they know that it has no power over them. Why? Because of what we read in our last study, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus Christ said, I give you power over serpents, the Kenites, and scorpions, the fallen angels, and over all the power of the enemy. You have power over all of your enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. You have, you have power to cast out evil spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. You tell them to go back to where they came from. And in the name of Jesus Christ, just cast them out, send them home. You have that power. And that, that great deception is coming. Where we talked about it's the greatest tribulation of all time. Because, because the fallen angels, how they come, claiming to be ministers of righteousness. Coming being so gentle. Coming to, to, to save your soul, bring you to the Messiah who has, who has returned. Don't believe it. Satan arrives at the sixth trumpet. And we will all still be in flesh bodies. Like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. At the last trump, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, we shall all be changed. When Jesus Christ returns, we will all be, we will instantly be changed into spiritual bodies. 
So you know that if there is, there's a supernatural entity performing miracles, sitting in Jerusalem claiming to be God, and you're still in a flesh body, you know that it's a false one. You know the false one comes first. This book of Joel teaching us how to not be deceived. Teaching us what the condition is going to be like in the church. How the meat is just cut off. What do you know? That prophecy has come to pass. But the, this whole book of Joel, how to lead up to the Lord's day, how to be not deceived, let's take heed to everything that's written in these minor prophets. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for giving us these minor prophets so that we can understand what's even coming in the future to us today. And we thank you for giving us this building so we have a place to fellowship in your name. And a place we can teach your word to where the meat is not cut off as long as we continue to teach your word. And we just thank you for the wisdom and the guidance you give us and ask you to continue to do that for us so we can get understanding, not just for us, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This was recorded February the 2nd, 2020 at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdom, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless.